We hope you enjoy the following video presentation sponsored by the C.S. Lewis Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization with a mission to equip and encourage Christians to live their faith within the world of ideas and arts. To help us continue to host events and make videos like this one, please make a donation after viewing the video by going to www.cslewis.org or clicking the link below. Thank you. Thank you. That was unbelievably kind, and um, I feel like I need to go home and get back to work now. Um, thanks to the C.S. Lewis Foundation for having me here. Uh, this is really quite cool for me. Uh, my love of Lewis is older than my faith, um, and he was the first scholar that I fell in love with before I knew what a scholar was, uh, and he's been a constant companion on my journey, so it's really great to share with those who, have, who are also trying to live into the the path that he marked out for us. Uh, while I was sitting at dinner last night with, uh, with Nick and Mary and Paul, the other plenary speakers, and they were so solicitous about me. They wanted to know all the news and what I was up to and what I was working on and whatnot, and that was very humbling for me um, as the youngest of the speakers to find them so interested in what I was doing. And it reminded me of a moment from Dante's Divine Comedy. He says, when they together short discourse had held, they turned to me with salutation kind, beckoning me, at the which my master smiled. Nor was this all, but greater honor still they gave me, for they made me of their tribe, and I was sixth amid so learned a band. From the fourth canto of Inferno. Uh, so thank you to my fellow speakers for making me feel very comfortable here as well. Uh, tonight I want to talk to you about the eyes of faith, beauty and the vision of God. This is um, the second part of what is eventually, uh, a few years from now, going to turn into a book on a theology of beauty. The first part was delivered to the Anselm Society in Colorado Springs when I talked to them about the nature of beauty, a theological definition of beauty. Um, and what I said to them then was that beauty is that which reminds us of God on the basis of the memory of God that we are born with, as it were, the eternity in our hearts. To me, this is what Lewis was on about when he talked about this story that we all know, that we all long to hear, that we all recognize, though muted, as it were, in all the things that we see and experience. I also consider Lewis's understanding of joy to be a species of beauty. Also, isn't this what Ecclesiastes is on about? When it says that God has set the whole in the heart of man, and yet we cannot tell what God has done from beginning to end. That the entirety of the story that we long for, the entirety of beauty, is already in our hearts. And we can neither understand the beginning of it, nor the end of it, but we can't ignore it when we come face to face with it. Now, I think this has many implications, but what's perhaps most glaring is that it means that several things will reduce to a familiar theological concept, specifically these four. First, the longing for beauty. Second, the way to see more beauty. Thirdly, the proper response to beauty and fourthly, the purpose of beauty. All of these were reduced to something that should be quite familiar to you theologically, namely, the vision of God, commonly called the beatific vision, the beautiful vision by earlier theologians. So we long for beauty because beauty is the connection, sometimes closer, as in the beauty of worship, and sometimes more distant, as in physical beauty, is the connection to that for which we all long most deeply and truly, that which alone can activate our proper joy. We long to see God, and following upon the incarnation, we long to see Jesus. The way to progress in beauty is to progress in the vision of God. The more clearly we see God, the more readily will we be reminded of him in all the things that are not God. The proper response to the experience of beauty 
would be to respond to the beautiful according to the very part of it that makes it beautiful. But this beauty bestowing property is nothing other than its capacity to remind us of its creator. Thus, we honor beauty most when we turn it into an occasion for seeing God more deeply. And of course, the purpose of beauty is that in seeing the creaturely thing, we might be made capable of seeing the creator whose creature it is. Beauty, without being self-negating, points beyond itself to the God of all beauty. Well, if, if this is all about seeing God, then it seems to me that we ought to spend some time talking about the nature of vision, just what that looks like. The relationship between one who sees and that which is seen has long been held to be of immense and mysterious import, especially in Western culture. A few examples. The Medusa, on the one hand, and the Greek gods, on the other hand, represent a spectrum of extreme beauty and extreme ugliness. And the Medusa both joined, for she was very beautiful and she was cursed to become very, very ugly. But here's the trick. Neither one, neither extreme beauty nor extreme ugliness in the Greek conception is safe for mortals. It's not safe for human vision. The sight of the Medusa was the destruction of the seer by petrification. But the sight of the unveiled glory of the gods was no less destructive. Simile, upon seeing Joe's unmasked glory, was consumed by flames. Isaiah expresses the same concern in chapter 6. He says, I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. God seems to confirm this to Moses when he says in Exodus 33, no one may see me and live. Well, because of this, there's been, shall we say, an understandable fear of seeing deep in Western culture. If you tell me that if I look at that thing, it'll destroy me, I don't want to look at it. I mean, I do want to look at it, and I do, and I destroy myself. That's part of the complexity of human condition as well. But I also don't want to. And yet, in spite of this rather understandable fear of seeing that which is too great for us, we are also, as a race, condemned biblically for exactly the lack of vision. We are condemned for having eyes and not seeing. Psalm 135, 16, 115, 5, Isaiah 6, 10, Jeremiah 5, 21, Ezekiel 12, 2, Matthew 13, 15, Mark 8, 18, Acts 28, 27. You get the picture? All over the place, God says, how dare you not see? What did I give you eyes for? This is because what underlay this ancient idea was the sentiment that divinity and humanity were fundamentally ill-suited for each other. That there existed between them a radical incommensurability and otherness, like matter and antimatter. And that they could not come together without the destruction of the lesser, and that would be us. And yet, the ancients could also not shake the idea that somehow there was a radical union of divine and human that was possible. This is expressed in the Greek view with the notion of demigods half-human and half-divine offspring of a very intimate union between the divine and human natures. In Israel, this was expressed in the hope for a Messiah who would be God with us, the Lord Almighty dwelling among his people in endless peace. Thus, the incarnation clarifies that the ancient expectation of destruction is not about just any meeting of the divine and the human, but of the encounter of the sinful and the divine. At the same time, it affirms a union closer than any ancient people ever dared to hope for. For in it, God becomes entirely human, but does not cease to be God in order to do so. And so in Christ we see God and are not destroyed, but are rather saved. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father full of grace and truth, John 1, 14, or John 14, 9, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. 
Now, I think this transforms vision into a theological duty, but also into the most unexpected grace. Now, it is not only not true that we cannot see God and hope to live, but rather it has become the case that only by seeing God can we find life at all. Our deepest longing and our deepest need unite in the divine demand to be seen. There's also a powerful connection to be made here between the one who sees and the one who is seen. Now at last, the deep-seated double longing of Western civilization is exposed and may be dealt with. We long to be seen as who we truly are, and we long to see God as he truly is. This comes to a marvelous culmination in the cultural production of Central Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries. Um, there, there's this idea of an ethical responsibility that comes immediately upon seeing. For instance, in Bertolt Brecht's play, The Caucasian Chalk Circle, the character seeing or not seeing is directly tied to their culpability and to what ultimately happens to them in the play. Um, and also the sense of being seen is shown marvelously in Rainer Maria Rilke's poem, The Archaic Bust of Apollo, in which the poet argues that the power that resided in the divine head of the statue, a head which is forever lost to time because it's just a bust, it's just a torso, uh, that the power of vision that resided there remains latent in the torso. The headless statue is transformed into the agent, and in a reversal of the theme of having eyes but not seeing, the statue without eyes sees omnipotent, omnipotently. There is no place in which it does not see you, the poet says, leading to the abrupt and shocking final line of the poem, an ethical imperative that rests easily on the divine authority to which the poet has ascribed it. You must change your life. Well, this means that vision is complicated, but it is essential to the whole question of beauty. Therefore, it is on vision that I will spend my time, and specifically vision as it relates to God. So, three ways to think about vision. God's vision, angelic vision, and human vision. First, God. For most early and medieval theologians, God's form of vision was unique. Um, God's, it, it's undisputed that God sees everything. That's what it means to be omniscient. But there was concern over exactly how it is that God does this. Surely, God cannot see multiple things the way that we do, namely, by first seeing one thing or a group of things, and then seeing another thing or a group of things, and so on until everything has been seen. One reason for this is because God is thought to see infinitely many things. And you can't see one thing and then another thing and then another thing and see infinitely many things because you'd never get to the end of seeing things. There's always something else to see. Right? You can't progress through an infinite series. Um, but another reason is because if God were to see things successively, then imagine a time, let's call it T1, at which God sees 1,000 things. And then at T2, God sees the next 1,000 things. Well, even if by this grouping God could succeed in getting to the end of seeing all the things that there are, it would be pretty obvious that at T1, God does not yet see the things that God will not see until T2. And so at no time, up until the very end of the series, is it true that God sees all things. And so you'd be claiming there was a time when God did not see all things, and over time God came to see all things, which is, in case you're keeping track at home, heretical. I'm a theologian. We like to tell you when you're being a heretic. It's not because we don't love you. It's just because we work really hard to figure out what all the heresies are, and we don't, it's not a good party trick. So, you know. But there was also a deeper problem. Because vision was so closely tied to knowledge, that is to say God could only have knowledge of things that God could see, such that seeing becomes just a metaphor to describe the fact that God knows something. There must be a deeper disanalogy between our way of seeing and God's way of seeing, precisely because there's a deeper disanalogy between our way of knowing and God's way of knowing. It's not that God just knows more stuff than you, and if you could know enough stuff, then you'd be God too. I think, I think people in our society sometimes think this. This is a gross mistake. God's fundamental way of knowing things is different than yours. Even if you could know all things, you still would not know all things in the way that God knows all things. And that's pretty important. So in our vision, 
the vision of a thing is caused by the existence of that thing. That is to say, if there's no car there, normally we won't see a car there. Now, I say normally, there are instances of hallucinations in which we seem to see what isn't there. But do you notice that in, in common speech, we tend to shy away from saying that someone sees something in the instance of a hallucination. We prefer to say that they think they see something. I think this indicates that we're not entirely comfortable classing hallucinations as a type of vision. It, it's a strange case for us. But if things had to exist first in order for God to see them, then God would not be the creator of things. Rather, God's vision can't be caused by those things. God's vision causes things. It precedes them. Now, these two differences between the way that God sees, that is to say that he doesn't see successively, and that his vision is causative rather than caused, um, this leads to the following account of divine vision. God sees all things simultaneously, and he does so not by turning his gaze upon the things themselves, but by turning his gaze upon himself. What this means is that God knows all things as extensions of the divine power. That is, knowledge of horses for God looks like this. God would say, if I exert divine power in this way, a swift, four-footed, equine animal would be the result. And because the particularities of things also rely on divine power, this allows God's knowledge to descend all the way to particulars. Not just horses, but American Pharaoh, as opposed to Secretariat. I'm from Kentucky. <laughs> God is even able in this way to know those things that will be actual, as distinct from those things that are possible but will never be actualized. He knows me as accomplished, but he knows the person I would have been had I been born to a race of Martians as something the divine power could have done, but didn't. The result is that God's vision is simple for he only ever looks at one thing, himself. And in that one thing, all other things are comprehended. It is important not to understand this in a pantheistic way, because that would make you a what? Thank you. It is not that all things are God. It's rather that all things can be understood from God. I suppose it's similar in mathematics. I say I suppose because I'm dreadfully bad at math. But I'm told that if you knew all the potentialities of the number one, you would also know all of the other numbers, which are formed by either iterating or dividing one, but all of which depend on the fundamental unity expressed in the number one. Another way to say it would be that all the, all the truths of mathematics rely upon the law of identity, that a thing is itself and nothing else. So that's divine vision, and that's really cool. Now let's talk about angelic vision. Angels are really important. By the way, I hope you believe that angels are real. Um, not because I think that there's a cherub floating over your bed, watching out for you, or something like this. Um, because, you know, by all accounts, angels are terribly dreadful creatures. Um, the first thing they always say when they see a human is, don't be afraid. And a cherub doesn't, as the, the little baby angels don't really inspire that in me. But I really do hope that you believe in angels for a couple of reasons. Um, the biggest one is that Jesus seemed to. And, you know, I mean, I've, I've had a lot of fancy schooling and whatnot, and, um, and, and yet I make it my, my ambition in life not to be more sophisticated in my knowledge than Jesus seems to be from a pretty straightforward reading of the gospel. So if Jesus thinks that there's demons and that they inhabit, inhabit people and that maybe they should be thrown out, then I'm going to think that too because I feel like he's got a better handle on things than I do. So please believe in angels. End of commercial. Angels also hold a very important place in theology, and so there's actually theological consequences when you take angels out of the system. Because what angels are is they, they exist in this place between God and humans. They share some characteristics with each. Like God, they are spiritual, which in this context means non-material. But like humans, they are creatures and therefore finite. By the way, this means that angels aren't halfway between God and humans. Angels are much more like humans than like God because there's still an infinite distance between an angel and God. God is self-caused, God is eternal, on and on. Angels are just the first creatures, just the most noble creatures. But here's the thing, when you've got angels there, and you go to your humanistic project of talking about how excellent the human faculties are, what a piece of work is a man, 
it's hard to get to the end of the Hamlet quote. It's hard to say in comprehension how like a God, when you know you've got angels in, up there between you and God who are quite a bit higher than you and yet quite a bit lower than God. So angels form uh, an important systematic function in that they help keep us from raising humanity too high. And also they make it harder for us to bring God down too low to our level because we've got to keep him up above the angels somehow. So I think angels are pretty important. Um, now, unlike humans, this is very interesting. Angels do not seem to have been created apart from the beatific vision. Right? You don't have the beatific vision. You don't see God in his glory and receive the fullness of blessedness from your vision of God right now. If I'm wrong about that, please see me afterwards and give me some tips. Now, it also seems to be true that Adam and Eve did not see God in that way either. That this was something that humanity was created without and we were to be tested. And if we stood the test, then we would receive that vision. Of course, we failed the test famously, and so God has made another way through Christ for us to come back to that vision that we're intended for. That does not seem to have been the case with angels. It seems to be the case that angels were created with the beatific vision. That their testing was choosing to prefer the sight of God to the sight of themselves while already in possession of the sight of God. And the ones we call angels are the ones who pass the test, and the other ones we call demons. Thus, angels were made to always gaze on God from the first moment of their being. It stands to reason, then, that unlike humans, they also see all things primarily by looking at God. However, like humans, angels are not infinite, and so they are not capable of seeing all things. Therefore, angelic cognition functions in a mode similar to God, namely, it's simple, but it is less effective. It doesn't see as much. God sees all things with a simple gaze, and angels see however many things they can see, also with a simple gaze. Okay, that brings us to human vision. Human vision is contrasted with both divine and angelic vision in that for us, vision is a bodily and therefore a material function. Thus, the proper object of vision for us, especially in this life, is also something material, and therefore not God. As a result, our vision is not simple, but complex. We see successively, because we are bound by time, and we see things discreetly, apart from their formal unity in the divine essence. So the distinctive difference between corporeal or human seeing and spiritual seeing may be reduced to a question of the object of vision. What are you seeing? Are you seeing God or are you seeing other stuff? And remember, those are the only types of things there are, by the way, God and other stuff. Some pretty big consequences of that, right? For example, so everything that's not God is a creature, right? So what's heaven? Heaven's a creature. Heaven isn't the place where God lives in the same way that earth is the place where you live. That would make heaven co-eternal with God and perhaps uncaused by God. Heaven is a created place that God made presumably for the angels and for us. Um, so in, in spiritual seeing like God and the angels have, there's one object and through that object all other things are seen. For that reason, all that is seen may be seen simultaneously and the act of vision can be considered to be single. There's one act of vision. What are you doing? I'm looking at God. What do you see? All kinds of stuff. In corporeal seeing, no one object contains any of the others because it is repugnant to bodies to be in the same place at the same time. That's why you bump into stuff. Therefore, well, that and, and you're clumsy. Therefore, what is seen is an object that shows nothing but itself. In this way, to see multiple objects requires multiple acts of vision. Because of this, vision is successive, because not all that can be seen is able to be seen at once, and it's compound. That is to say, several different acts of vision combine to form what we are normally accustomed to call seeing. For example, right now you're seeing me, but you're also seeing people around you, you're seeing the room that we're in, all sorts of things. And indeed, doesn't the case of hallucinations confirm this? For we judge it not to be a true account of seeing precisely because there is no corresponding object there to be seen. Now, you don't say that I hallucinate seeing Scott down here because he's really there. But if I say that Mozart is sitting next to Scott, then I've crossed over into the realm of hallucination. 
So the object, rather than the subject, determines the act of seeing. Now, I want to say that this is a general principle of creaturely seeing. It's also true for the angels that the object and not the subject determines the act of seeing. For them, the object is God, and therefore their vision is of a certain sort. It's also true for creatures. We see stuff, and so our vision of a certain sort. In God, in divine vision, subject and object are actually the same. And so there's a way in which the divine case of vision transcends the question of subject and object. Now, the composite aspect of human vision is characteristic. And so human vision, it turns out, is reductive. It has a tendency to group things in order to present multiple objects of vision as a single object of vision. So when you see this room, the tendency of your sight is to see the whole as a single uniform thing, not as discrete acts of vision. But this is, of course, compositional. You are, in fact, seeing many different things at once. Vision reduces, but it cannot simplify. The end result remains a composite. It never truly becomes one, as the divine and angelic object of vision is. So when you see two things at once, this isn't actually a single act of vision. What you have is a simultaneity of two distinct acts of vision, or double vision. OK. Now, our longing, as I mentioned, is to see God. And I've just been saying that we don't see God, we see all this other stuff. Um, while it may be the case that this longing will only be fulfilled eschatologically, that is, you're, you're probably only ever going to see God the way you want to see God at the end of all things, when Christ comes again in glory, which is another doctrine I recommend to you, by the way, that Christ is coming again. This isn't a metaphor or a joke. He will come back, and it will be very serious. So that's when you're going to get what you really want. That's probably the time that you're really going to see God the way you want it to be. But then there's this thing, right? Christ seems to be claiming in John that there is a type of vision of God that is possible in this life. Namely, a type of vision of God that is mediated through the Son. So let's pause for a minute on the nature of what Christ says when he says that we see the Father by seeing the Son. It's such a curious thing. First, I think we should avoid interpreting this in any sense that will lead to heresy, uh, namely, as if the Father and the Son are not distinct. There's a wonderful video that's going around the internet where St. Patrick is trying to explain the Trinity to simple Irish folk. If you haven't seen this, check out St. Patrick's bad Trinitarian analogies, right? He, he goes, well, the Trinity is like water, and it's like, because it's, sometimes it's ice, and, it's, and the, these simple Irish folk who are supposed to know nothing about theology pause and say, that's modalism, Patrick! Right. <laughs> and everything he tries to use to explain the Trinity, they tell him, actually, you've just, now you've committed this heresy, now you've committed this heresy. I don't agree with the conclusion of the video, which is that the Trinity can't be explained. That's, that's not really true. It can't be exhaustively explained. But there's quite a lot of useful and important things that can be said about the Trinity, and you should maybe look into that. But that's for another time. Um, so it can't be the case. Christ can't be saying, well, the Father and I are really just the same guy. Um, and so when you see me, you see him because we're the same dude. Just as if, if you've seen Tullius, you've seen Cicero. Because Tullius and Cicero are the same person. The guy's name is Marcus Tullius Cicero. Right? That's not right. That can't be what Christ means. Instead, he seems to mean we see one person, and this person is his own person, and has characteristics that do not belong to any other divine person. Most notably in this instance, he was born of a virgin, he has a human nature. That's not true of the Father or of the Holy Spirit. And yet seeing this one person somehow also counts as seeing a totally different person, one who is not in himself visible to us in this current life and who may or may not be visible to us in the next life apart from Christ. So this is the point where it would be helpful if I could attempt an analogy. Um, but examples drawn from the world we know are going to be tricky because there's always going to be an important element of disanalogy between this world and God. Now, with that caveat, maybe this will serve as what I'd call a plausibility enhancer. I drive a Ford Focus. So does Bob. Our cars are the same year and have the same options. My car is silver. His is black. It seems that I could say in a non-trivial sense that if you've seen my car, you've seen Bob's car. However, and this is where the disanalogy comes in. In the simplest of senses, you just haven't. 
you just haven't seen Bob's car. Bob's car is not, in fact, my car. And so seeing my car is not actually seeing Bob's car. It is instead knowing what Bob's car would look like without actually seeing Bob's car. Is that what Christ means? Maybe. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> like it's very important to say it when you don't know what a passage of Scripture means. And there's a lot of them. That I just got no idea. There's some of them that some folks have some very cool explanations of, and I don't really want them to be right, and so I'm withholding judgment. But I'm not gonna, I'm gonna admit that I don't know what they mean. But what if it isn't? What if he means something stronger? Not, you know what I'm like, so you know what the Father is like, but rather, in seeing me, you are also really seeing him. Such a claim would mean that there is at least one situation in which human vision, which normally sees by means of discrete acts of vision, sees more than one thing in a single act, namely, when we see the Father through the Son. St. Bonaventure has a name for this type of vision. He calls it contuition. This is going to be a central concept for the notion of beauty that I am developing. So let's take a moment to talk about what contuition means. Contuition is a really cool Latin word that literally means co-seeing. In its most fundamental sense, it is the vision of the creature along with the God after whom the creature is patterned. Thus, whenever we enter into those Psalm 19 moments and see something of God and the beauty of nature, this is contuition. For example, to see a landscape such as out by the study center, and to see it as the image of the majesty of God. Note that you don't cease to see the landscape in such moments. Rather, it is the vision of the landscape as what it is in itself that opens space for the vision of the landscape to also be a vision of God. This could only happen if the landscape is truly an image of God, even if not so express an image as a human or an angel. And surely also this is the most charitable interpretation we could give to the final words of the main characters in Les Miserables when they say to love another person is to see the face of God. If they don't mean this, they probably mean something heretical. Another example, when Christ was revealed to the disciples on the road to Emmaus and the breaking of the bread, one of the most astonishing passages in Luke, this was not contuition. Rather, one whom they did not recognize before suddenly became recognizable. But when Christ is recognized by the faithful in the breaking of the bread in the Eucharist, this is contuition. For even though many of us hold him to be truly present bodily on the altar, nevertheless, what we see is either bread or the appearance of bread, not the actual body and blood of Christ. Thus, when the body and blood are discerned, they are seen together with the bread as distinct realities, but in the very same act of vision by which the bread is seen. Again, this is not double vision. That would mean two acts of vision, two acts of seeing that are taking place concurrently. Instead, contuition is to see two things with one simple act of vision, precisely because by seeing one thing, you also see something else. Thus, contuition is a type of spiritual seeing. The second object seen is not present bodily and is thus not seen physically. It's a, it's a type of spiritual seeing in which humans attain to a type of vision that is analogous to how God and the angels see. Contuition is enabled precisely because the second object, God, is seen within the first object as that object's inner meaning, as that to which it points. Each creature, when it becomes an occasion for contuition, opens up a space within itself, or better, allows itself to become translucent, so that while one continues to see it, one also sees that of which it is an image. This is the original purpose of creatures. This is why there are creatures at all. And so we use creation most rightly when we enable it to usher us through its inner mystery to its proper meaning, which is hidden in God. Okay, so 
all sorts of interesting background work on vision. Now we're ready for the big payoff, contuition and beauty. It is my claim that the experience of the beautiful is implicitly or explicitly a contuition. Implicit contuition is the most normal form of the experience of the beautiful in a world characterized by willful God-forgetfulness. We live in a world of willful God-forgetfulness. And don't ever forget that the people around you and yourself, when you don't see God, it's because you don't want to. Right? Even when we want to see God, we also don't want to see God because our hearts are divided. So, in this type of world, implicit contuition is the most normal form of the experience of the beautiful. It is this that has enabled us to fail to notice that the experience of the beautiful is always about God, right? Because you seem like, why doesn't everybody know this? Anyone who thinks that anything is beautiful ought to just be a Christian. Well, because we've forgotten that this is what the beautiful is really all about. And so we don't make the connection. Many are they who worship in the temple of beauty. Some explicitly like the romantic poets and their successors, the aesthetes, and some implicitly like Hollywood and we, its many hangers-on. The rhetoric of the worshipers of beauty is always concerned with ineffability. Beauty is inexpressible and undeniable. It compels us without revealing its true nature. It summons us we know not whither, and we gladly follow. But this is disingenuous. We are, in fact, are not at all interested in where beauty leads. We don't really care. Because this would bring us face to face with the ground of beauty, the one who dwells in the beauty of holiness. Rather, what we want is the beautiful itself. Our desire is to convert the beautiful into the thing itself, not a sign on the way to the true destination. In this way, we suppress contuition. We deny spiritual vision and ally ourselves with the bodily tendency of human vision to reduce all things down to one. When I say that, I don't mean to say that the body is bad and the spirit is good and bodily vision is bad and we have to get away from it. I'm not saying that. And in fact, there's, there's a right use of bodily vision's reductive power upon which I think contuition hangs. You can't follow things back to God if that reductive power of bodily vision isn't at play. But there's also, as with all things in this sinful world, there's also a bad use of bodily vision. And there's a sort of laziness about it that we tend to ally ourselves with, where it's just easier to think that that thing seems cool, that must be all there is to it, rather than to say, and why is it cool? What is the ground of the cool? How do I get more of it? Um, among the two things on offer, the thing that the occasion for the experience of the beautiful, and the thing that it's about that makes it such that it's beautiful in the first place, we choose the lesser of the two, the creature. The religion of beauty is a chasing after the wind because it treats the penultimate as the ultimate. In confusing the means with the end, it sacrifices its ability to arrive anywhere. Now, ineffability is challenging because there's a lot of different ways by which something can come to be unspeakable. Properly speaking, the unspeakable is that which is because of its nature not able to be spoken. This is the most proper use of the word unspeakable or ineffable. Now, God is not this way in the first instance because God speaks himself to us in the word revealed in scripture and incarnate in history. And he also invites our talk about him, summons us to the task of theological reflection by encouraging us to tell of the goodness of the Lord. Isaiah 63, 7, Psalm 71, 15. But the fullness of the divine nature surpasses the power of speech. And so there is a meaningful way in which God is ineffable in this first way. There are things about God, or there's a totality of who God is that just can't be spoken. Now, that is also called unspeakable that is not allowable to speak. For example, if a subject has been forbidden in open court and the attorneys and witnesses are not allowed to talk about it, it may be called unspeakable. <coughs> Note that this is not to do with the nature of the thing itself, 
which can certainly be spoken. If it couldn't be spoken, no one would forbid you to speak it. But rather, it has to do with an injunction laid on the speaker by a higher authority. Often, this is a religious authority such that the unspeakable is that which would cause offense to the gods. In this way, the unspeakable is just a way of describing blasphemy. And one of the, one of the great old Latin words for something that is blasphemous is that it's unspeakable, nephos. And then there is that which is unspeakable because it causes horror or great revulsion, not to some higher authority, but to the partners in the conversation. Societal examples include things like incest, pedophilia, etc. We prefer not to talk about such things. It's not good conversation for bag in. This is the dynamic that underlies Voldemort in Harry Potter. Right? This is the sense in which he is he who must not be named. The reason he must not be named is for fear that he will hear and appear, or for fear of the horrible things one will remember to have happened if one is reminded of the name. Now, so far as I know, the Ministry of Magic has made no pronouncements against saying his name, nor is it in itself unspeakable, I just said it, Voldemort. Rather, there is a socially agreed upon rule that we just don't say his name. Okay, so to which one of these types of ineffability is the experience of the beautiful meant to belong? Its worshipers would argue that it is the first sort. Beauty is in itself ineffable because it is so high above our realm that our language cannot touch it, but can only point to it. Do you recognize the language of religion here? Doesn't this sound like temple language? But on the one hand, our incessant desire to speak of it belies this claim. We find beauty eminently effable. Ask anyone who's recently in love, right? What's so great about this person you love? Oh, let me tell you. I could go on all day. Please don't. Beauty may at best be like God, speakable but not exhaustible. On the other hand, the ineffability of beauty seems to be grounded in our inability to explain why it comes and goes as it does, why it affects us so strongly, and things of this sort. Interestingly, this is not hard to explain once we have accepted that beauty is what reminds us of God. Each of these questions becomes very answerable. Right? It comes and goes as it does because we are imperfectly, we have an imperfect vision of God, and so we're not very good at recognizing God in the things around us. And so the fact that I find this person beautiful and that person not shows a failure in me to understand God because I can't see how this other person is also as beautiful an expression of the divine nature, as beautiful an image. But once we've answered all those types of things, a residue of ineffability remains. But at that point, it is the ineffability of the God of whom it reminds us and our relationship to him, not of the beautiful as such. Thus, it doesn't seem to me that the first type of ineffability best describes the experience of the beautiful, but rather it best describes that which is the horizon of the experience of the beautiful, that which the experience of the beautiful is about. Okay, so what about the second type? Well, surely it's not the second type, right? Whoever told you what secular or, or sacred authority ever told you not to talk about beauty? If anyone has that, I'd love to know. That's, that would be so interesting, right? So it's not the case that beauty is unspeakable because it's been forbidden by some higher authority for you to talk about it. I'd like to suggest that the ineffability that we continually run up against in our fallen experiences of the beautiful is of the third type. It is an, an ineffability of horror and revulsion. Now, this is counterintuitive. But I think there's something to it. This is a funny sentence. Isn't that weird, I said. What are we afraid of? What horrifies us if the experience is of being wrapped in the joy of the beautiful? Well, is it not exactly the thing that we do not wish to admit in such an experience? In short, isn't it precisely the divine of whom this thing reminds us that we remain terrified of. Thus, we claim ineffability in order to disconnect beauty from its moorings. It is the fig leaf behind which we attempt to hide from God. 
As a society, we have agreed that he is not to be talked about, that he must not be named, and so we go on seeking the beauty without the power and wondering why it keeps slipping through our fingers, why it never satisfies. The experience of the beautiful indeed belongs to general revelation, the fact that God has placed knowledge of himself in all of creation. You don't need Christ for it. You don't need the scriptures for it. You're supposed to be able to know things about God from it. Romans 1 condemns you for not knowing certain things about God just from looking at creation. So this witness of God, that God is left of his majesty, his glory, his faithfulness in every corner of creation, this is part of the experience of the beautiful. In our world, this revelation is not recognized as such. That is to say, it is not seen to be a revelation, but is thought to be merely facts, which have no meaning behind their ability to point to impersonal laws that we can manipulate for our technical purposes. Does that sound beautiful? Right? Isn't this why the poets have an uneasy relationship with technology? Because there's a tendency to cut the meaning out of things in order to manipulate and control. The revelation, interestingly, is not disproved. It's simply denied. This was an important thing for me. I went, I went to Yale in part to find out what the best liberal arguments were against the form of Christianity that I was deeply convinced was true. I wanted to know what all of their great ideas were so that I could find out if maybe I could come up with arguments to defeat them and convert the world to Christianity. Wouldn't that be cool? You know what I found when I got there? I found that there just weren't any arguments. They didn't not believe in Christianity or they didn't not believe in Christianity of a certain sort because of some fantastic argument they'd read in Kant or Weber. They didn't believe in Christianity because they didn't want to. They didn't believe in Christianity of a certain sort because they were Democrats first and Christians second, or Americans first and Christians second, or parents first, and, or anything else first and Christians second. And so any ways in which the gospel challenged how they wanted their lives to be was something that must be cultural and had to be reinterpreted and we bring our sophisticated hermeneutical apparatus to reworking it technically into something that we could control. You see, I think much biblical scholarship today makes the mistake of treating the Bible as an object that we read. I think faithful encounter with the scriptures says that it's not so much that you read the Bible as that the Bible reads you. Okay, let's all talk about implicit contuition. Now I want to say a bit about explicit contuition. This is the province of the religious and the spiritual of those who have begun cultivating the eyes to see that there is more to this world than what appears on the material surface. I do not mean in the first instance mystical visions, although they are interesting. As visions of spiritual truths represented in bodily things, they are perhaps the most intense form of contuition. For the physical world here achieves such transparency that it finds the complete fulfillment of its role as servant to the spiritual realm. But. The physical things are often in danger of becoming so transparent that they are nothing more than the other thing that they represent. And when that happens, I think you leave the realm of contuition for the realm of allegory. And I don't say that to denigrate allegory. Allegory is useful pedagogically. It's delightful in a literary sense. But theologically, it's weak on the affirmation of the good of the creaturely and the bodily and so tends towards docetic understandings of Christology. Allegory tends towards the idea that Christ just appears human, not that he really and enduringly forever is human. Nor do I mean primarily a vague religious sense that senses behind nature a quote unquote higher power or deeper meaning or whatever other impersonal expressions one wants to use. Right? And that's what's offensive about such expressions religiously is that they are impersonal. So they remove the personhood of God. We believe in a God who is not only personal, he's personal to such a radical extent that he's three persons. Right? Um, now, I do want to say, however, that such things are not bad. 
Someone who senses through nature that there is more is on the right track and is easier to bring along the road to faith than one who denies that nature means anything other than itself or that there is anything more to reality than what we can quantify. Nevertheless, these are not really contuitions because of the very vagueness. Nothing is really seen. Instead, they are intuitions, or better, intimations. They are the seeds from which contuition may spring, but they are not yet germinated. There is, of course, also a properly religious contuition that is not Christian. It terminates in the vision of God as deity, that is, in his oneness, power, holiness, all those things that Romans says can be seen just from creation. This is, in fact, to see God rightly, right? God is all-powerful. God is holy. God is greater than the sum of all created things. So this does see God rightly, but it does not yet see God well, because God is never well understood when God is understood apart from the three persons of the Trinity. Thus, the truest contuition is Christian contuition, which sees not just the creator God, but the God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the richness and goodness of created things. It's the duty of the Christian to cultivate eyes that see in this way. To the eyes of faith, God's glory is declared everywhere, and God's power is at work everywhere. Such eyes are the needed response to the functional deism most of us in the West have fallen into, epitomized in our despair when we feel that every avenue has been exhausted and all we can do is pray. It's staggering how backwards and faithless this is. Prayer is the most powerful tool in our arsenal, not a last-ditch effort in whose efficacy we don't really believe. Now, this vision, these eyes, are also the natural result of sanctification. The more one sees of God, the more one experiences God, the better one becomes at finding him in other places, and the more apt one becomes to receive more of him. Grace builds upon grace. It's, Bonavich would put it this way. There's really, if, if you've got a person who's sitting in darkness and you want them to see the noonday sun. Of course, you can't just take them out into the noonday sun because they won't see the sun. They'll just be blinded by the excess of light. So what can you use to make this person better suited to see that bright light? Interestingly, there's nothing in the world you can use to make a person better prepared to see light than light. Little bits of light enables a person's vision to strengthen to see more of light and more and more and more, and that's Dante's journey in Paradiso. So, Let's return to the moment of the beautiful. You're back out there at the study center looking out over the beautiful grounds. And say that one has overcome the sinful urge to shrink, from, to shrink in horror from the God that it reveals and so has moved beyond the ineffability of revulsion into the proper ineffability of the beautiful moment. There, isn't there still an ineffable residue that remains? Right? Malcolm spoke of an, an ineffability and we all were touched because we all know the experience and we know he's right. What about, what are we to do with that? Again, this cannot be the ineffability of horror because by supposition, you've gotten past that. You've accepted that it's God that is the engine that's driving this incredible moment. So, in fact, what's happened is you've returned to ineffability of the first type, of that which exceeds the power of speech and reason. It, it lies within the power of speech and reason. That is, it can be spoken about and talked about, but it also exceeds it. And so at some point, speech and reason will fail. It is not the beautiful itself that is mysterious. It is the God to whom it points who is mysterious. Or rather, the mystery of the beautiful is grounded in its relation to something that so very greatly exceeds it. So the mystery and ineffability of the beautiful are participations in the divine mystery and ineffability. As such, they are distinct. For where there's identity, there's no participation. They must be actually different things for the one to participate in the other. And yet the lesser would not exist apart from the greater. Thus, the beautiful is not ineffable in the first way as if it belonged to the category of immensity that grounds the first way. My wife is beautiful. There's ineffability about her beauty. It is not because she is as immense as God. Rather, it is because she participates in God's 
proper belonging to the first word being beautiful. Something of God's immensity is reflected in her smile. And that is why it is so beautiful. It can be properly said to be ineffable, but not most properly. Now, it must be said that explicit contuition is not the exclusive province of the religious. Explicit contuition of the divine will sometimes seize hold of those who are hard at work cultivating an unassailable God forgetfulness. I've known, for example, scientists who were and are to this day not believers, who in reflecting upon their scientific work have been forced to reach for a religious language. One of my friends while doing his PhD at MIT said to me, he, he, we had known each other when he was a Yale undergraduate, and he came back and we were talking and, and he said, I, I was hoping I would see you on this trip because I wanted to talk to you about what I've been seeing in my lab. The things that I'm seeing at the molecular level are so unbelievable that I feel like I'm looking over the shoulder of God. And I said, Dave, you're an atheist. And he said, I know. <laughs> and I said, well, don't you think that's a bit conflicted? And he says, yes, I do. <laughs> what do you plan to do about that, Dave? He says, I don't know. I'm not ready for the implications of what that would mean, but I can't find a better way to say what I feel. This person has had an explicit contuition, I think. Um, in that moment, people like this nearly believe in spite of themselves. And in fact, I think it's just possible that everyone has these moments of explicit contuition in their lives as part of the larger divine strategy to bring them to salvation. We, we tend to fall into the trap of thinking, oh, God's not doing enough to save people. Listen, friends, God is doing so much. God is doing nearly everything God can do to save people. In fact, God's response to injustice in the world is so robust. There's only one thing God has left to do in response to injustice in the world. And you don't want that to happen yet. <laughs> right? He's holding off precisely because he's trying to make more time for repentance. This is, this is a spectacular truth. If you really understand this truth, then all of the suffering you experience in this world is transformed, right? Because you're still here. Why don't you just be at rapture the second you become a Christian? Well, you're still here precisely to be a witness to those people who don't have the gospel yet. If that's true, if you react properly to your suffering, then every moment of suffering you experience in this world is for the salvation of another, is for the glory of God's kingdom. All of your suffering, my friends, is martyrdom. But only if you turn it to the glory of God. Only if you give over self-pity and suffer for the other. Take, turn your distress into an opportunity to pray for those on whose behalf a world that can cause us so much pain must still continue to exist so that that pain will have a meaning. Okay, so where do we go from here? I've been progressing an argument based on the claim that the beautiful is that which reminds us of God that asks us to therefore treat the experience of the beautiful as an opportunity to sharpen our eyes of faith so that we may more readily and steadily discern the presence of God in the world and in our lives. The next step in this line of thinking, which lies beyond the scope of our time together, is a reflection on the being of creatures in their relation to God, the way in which all creatures in some way image God, how far this likeness can be pressed, and where to situate the gulf that must at some point exist between God and creatures, the very definitional distinction between that which is infinite and self-caused and that which is finite and caused by another. Such a reflection should further dampen enthusiasm for the religion of beauty by showing the fundamental inadequacy of the creature to fulfill the nature of the longing that is activated in the experience of the beautiful. To end with, I will simply remind you of the longing. We not only long to see beautiful things, but beautiful things themselves awaken in us a longing that the possession of the beautiful cannot itself fulfill. This is, of course, because the longing is not in the first instance for the beautiful thing that was the occasion of longing, but for that of which the beauty reminds us. This is a distinctly this-worldly phenomenon. Under the conditions of sin, we do not have union with our origin and goal. We are exiles and vagabonds, and the world at its most beautiful is still a valley of tears, drenched in the suffering of people under just condemnation. 
But it will not always be so. Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. In these days, we celebrate the memorial of our redemption in the mysteries of the body and blood. And though he deigns to be present with us in this celebration, when he does so, he comes into our world with all of its mess, uncertainty, and horror. But there will come a day when we celebrate with him in his world. That is, in the world conditioned first, middle, and last by his presence. A world drenched in the glory of God, even more than our present world is drenched in sin. And in that time, the beautiful will awaken not painful longing, but satisfaction and worship. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thank you.